In James chapter 5, verse 12, we're continuing our study of the letter of James. Say what you mean and mean what you say. If you look at the back of your bulletin, you can see all of the scripture that we'll look at this morning. Or if you have the Version Bible app on your phone, you can go to events on your phone and Britain Christian Church will be there listed. You can click on that and all of the scriptures will be there for you. Have you ever seen the movie Liar, Liar with Jim Carrey? It's a classic. It's over 20 years old. I, I can't hardly believe that. I think I was seven or eight when I saw it for the first time. It was, it was filmed at the time that Jim Carrey was larger than life, at the height of his stardom. And he plays a slick, high-powered attorney named Fletcher Reed. Fletcher's very successful. He um, is very good at what he does because he's such a great liar, to be real honest. And he will lie about anything and everything in order to accomplish his goal of winning cases and one day becoming a partner at the firm. That's a problem. But the bigger problem is uh, Fletcher's desire to uh, win at all costs in his practice has bled over into every area of his life so that he's willing to lie to anybody about anything, and he's reaping the consequences of that. His marriage fell apart. His ex-wife, Audrey, knew that if she saw Fletcher's lips moving, that he was lying. Fletcher loves his young son, Max, but he's so wrapped up in his own life and being a success that he lets his little boy down time and time again. The straw that broke the camel's back was really when Fletcher had made a promise to Max to be there at his fifth birthday party. The house was packed with people. The birthday cake was there. Little Max kept asking his mom, is dad here? Is dad here? And dad never showed. So in spite of the fact that the whole house was full of people who had come to help Max celebrate his fifth birthday, all of that was overshadowed in Max's mind and heart by the one person who wasn't there, his own dad. When it was time to blow out the candles, Max's mom said, Honey, you can make any wish you want. And so Max made a wish, and he blew out the candles. And his wish was that his dad would be unable to lie for a whole day. And his wish was granted. His dad couldn't lie. And the rest of the movie is hilarious. I mean hilarious. When Fletcher realizes that he can't lie, he becomes unnerved. He can't function without lying. He just, everywhere he turns, he, he's saying the wrong things. He's, he, finally, he's talking to his ex-wife, and he tells her what's going on in his life. And she said, mm, Max made a wish. He made a wish that you'd be unable to lie. And so Fletcher made a beeline to Max's school in the middle of the day. He checks Max out of class, and he's cutting up with his son. He goes, hey, buddy, I heard you made a wish at your birthday that daddy couldn't lie. Yep, you need to take that back. <laughs> and Max said, why, so you can lie? Yeah, but not to you. Not to you, Max. And then Fletcher tries to explain it to his five-year-old son. He goes, these are his exact words. Max, no one can survive in the adult world if they have to tell the truth. I could, I, I, I could lose my case. I could lose my promotion, even my job. I have to lie, Max. Everyone lies. Everyone lies. Everyone. And you know what? There's not one person in this sanctuary this morning who is not told a lie at one point or another, maybe even this morning. There's not one person who has never told a lie that's seated in this sanctuary this morning. We're taught from a young age to tell the truth, right? I mean, whether you grew up in a Christian family or not, your mom, your dad, they told you from a young age to tell the truth. But it doesn't take long to figure out that sometimes when you tell the truth, you get in trouble, so we learn to lie. Dr. Romeo Vitelli has written an article for Psychology Today. The article is called, When Does Lying Begin? And he states in his article that the skills needed for lying are already in place in children by age two. Wow. Here's what he says. 
He goes on to write, in 1877, Charles Darwin suggested that children as young as 30 months are capable of lying after seeing his young son trying to deceive him. More recently, a team of British psychologists used natural observation method to spot 37 examples of lying behavior in a 30-month-old child. Child researchers at the University of Waterloo reported 65% of two-year-olds and 95% of four-year-olds have lied. Boy, we figure things out early, don't we? And it doesn't get any better the older that we get. The older that we get, it seems like there are no areas of our life that are sacred. All of them are tainted by lies. Politicians make promises during election season that they know good and well they'll never keep. Teenagers lie to their parents about where they're going on Friday night and who they're going to be spending time with. We lie to the government when we fill out our tax returns. People include things on their resumes that they know are not true because they want to impress people who have the power to hire them and give them a job. Businesses and corporations lie when they know that to tell the truth would impact their bottom line. Husbands and wives lie to each other about how they spend their money, their online activity, and relationships that they know are not healthy for their marriage. The list goes on and on. <clears throat> it seems like there is absolutely nothing that we won't lie about. Back in 1991, James Patterson and Peter Kim wrote a bestseller. It was called The Day America Told the Truth. They polled, they gave surveys to 2,000 people that were in 50 different locations across the United States. It was an extensive survey, like 1,800 questions, and they promised absolute anonymity. The book covers all kinds of topics, but I find what they learned about telling the truth, or, or maybe it would be better to say the decline of telling the truth to be most interesting. After tabulating the data from the surveys, they concluded, these are their words, lying has become an integral part of American culture, a trait of the American character. We lie and don't even think about it. We lie for no reason. Patterson and Kim estimated that 91% of us lie regularly, daily. Is it any wonder that in 2016, just two years ago, the Oxford Dictionary declared the phrase post-truth to be the international word of the year? Post-truth. I hope you recognize all of the information that I've shared with you None of it has been from some preacher who has this doomsday scenario of how America is going to hell in a handbasket morally. Neither did I quote from some right-wing organization that's always trying to trump things up. I have just shared with you the assessments, the conclusions of secular sociologists, psychologists, and modern-day authors. All of them who have their fingers on the pulse of America and what's been going on in our society for a long time. And that leads me to our scripture this morning. We're, we, can, we only have time for one verse. So um, take a look at James 5.12. James writes to the brothers and sisters in Christ, and he says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no or you will be condemned. Now, i got to set this up for you. Every word within the Word of God in the Bible is set in context. So we can't take some verse out and read into it what we want it to say or what we think it says. That's one of the things that drives me crazy about Bible study, when people will go, well, what do you think this verse means? Having no understanding of the context of what's going on. Well, we have spent the last two weeks in James 5, verses 1 through 11. We've understood that James wrote this letter to Christians, followers of Jesus, who had been scattered because of persecution and who now were suffering. They were being taken advantage of by powerful rich people who looked for every advantage to take advantage of them. 
And then next week, when we roll over into James chapter 5, verse 13, in verses 13 through 17, we'll see a whole other set of scenarios of difficulties that the followers of Jesus are facing. So there's difficulties coming at them from every angle. And throughout James' letter to these followers of Jesus, these persecuted followers of Jesus, these followers of Jesus who are suffering, his word to them has been this. You be men and women of faith. You trust God. You be men and women of faith. You remember in verse 511, James, James said, God's full of compassion. God's full of mercy. You be people of faith. Trust Him. God's sovereign. He knows where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. He's promised to lead you all the way through. Be men and women of faith. Trust God. Don't resort to other means to get around this, under this. Don't manipulate. Don't maneuver. You be a man of God. You be a woman of God. You see, being people of faith, people with absolute trust, in the Lord. People with total reliance upon Jesus. That is such a contrast to how most people respond when they find themselves in a pinch, under stress, stuck between a rock and a hard place, facing the hardships in life. And that's not only true of unbelievers, it's true of many people who say that they're followers of Jesus as well. When we find ourselves in relationships that are troubled, we can easily shade the truth. We can say what we think the other person wants to hear, or we can flat out lie to avoid further tension in that relationship. When we want something, and, but we need other people to work with us to help us get it, then we can make all kinds of promises. Hey, if you'll help me this time, I promise I'll do such and such. We'll even go so far as to swear to emphasize our seriousness, our sincerity. We'll say things like, God is my witness. I, I, I swear on my mother's grave, I'm telling the truth. Cross my heart and hope to die, right? You know, all of those things are nothing more than the tricks of the trade and the art of deception. To trying to convince people that we're being sincere when we're going through painful experiences in life, we can easily resort to bargaining with God if he'll just help us out this time. This time. Well, James calls us to live a life of radical truth in every area of our life. We're not to shade the truth. We're not to swear to emphasize our truthfulness. We're not to bargain with God. Instead, our word is to be our word. Our yes is to be yes. And when we say no, it is to be no. We are to say what we mean and mean what we say. I told you before, James was Jesus' younger half-brother, right? Who never believed in Jesus while Jesus was alive ministering on the earth. Never believed in him. It was only after Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected, Jesus appeared to his younger brother, his half-brother James, and then James became a believer. Even though James wasn't a believer, he was a listener to the things that Jesus was saying. All the time Jesus was alive, he was paying attention even though he didn't believe. You say, Mike, how do you know that? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read together verses 33 through 37. It's the Sermon on the Mount, a piece of the Sermon on the Mount. See if you don't recognize what we read in James 5, 12. Again, Jesus is speaking. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oath that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So if we take Matthew chapter 5 and we lay it right next 
to what James wrote in, in James chapter 5, verse 12, it's no wonder. We don't have to guess where James came up with his command not to swear or to make oaths. When James says not to swear, you need to know this, he's not talking about using foul language. You need to go to other parts of the Bible to know that we're not supposed to talk like that. James is addressing the fact of taking oaths or making vows. Oh, I swear I'll do it this time. Those kind of things. What's really interesting about that is that when you read the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, then you'll notice that God encourages His people to make vows in His name. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in Numbers chapter 30. Let's read those together. Moses told the people, Fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Hold fast to Him and take your oaths in His name. In Numbers 30, verse 2, when a man makes a vow to the Lord, to Yahweh, or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he says. And as we read the Old Testament, we, find, we run into all kinds of people that are making vows, that are pledging oaths. In 1 Samuel 20, David made an oath to Jonathan, the son of King Saul, the king that tried to kill David. And then in 1 Samuel 24, Saul knew that David was going to be king one day. And so Saul went to David and said, Promise me that when you become king, you will not wipe out my family and you will not wipe out my name. And David made an oath to Saul at that point. In Joshua chapter 6, Joshua swore an oath before God after he wiped out the city of Jericho. In Acts chapter 18, verse 18, Paul got a haircut. He cut his hair off because of a vow that he had made. And then in Romans chapter 1, verse 9, Paul said, God is my witness how much I remember all of you in prayer as he wrote to the people in Rome. And in the book of Revelation, we read where even an angel pledged an oath in Revelation 10. The angel swore an oath and then said, there will be no more waiting, no more delay. So you see, oaths were encouraged by God in the Old Testament. See there, I told you, the Bible contradicts itself. All of you Christians, you believe all that stuff in the Bible, you can't even see the Bible doesn't even agree with itself. Oh, hold on just a minute. Why did Jesus and James say, stop making oaths? Stop making vows? It's not because it was that that was wrong. It was what people did with it that mangled it and morphed it into something that you and I still pledge and practice today. We'll get to that in just a second. You see, those who made the oaths in the Old Testament, they kept their word, even if it hurt. Even if it hurt. I didn't make up that last phrase. David listed that in Psalm 15. Look at Psalm 15 with me, where David makes a list of the character qualities of people who might dwell in God's sanctuary. David writes, a Psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath, and there it is, even when it hurts, who lends his money without interest, without usury, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Well, you can tell from reading Psalm 15, God desires truthfulness and not deception. God desires righteousness or being rightly related to those around us, not duplicity. God desires integrity and not corruption. All that is described in Psalm 15 can really be summarized with one phrase. God desires truth in and from His people. Truth. So you got to ask the question, 
Why did Jesus and James say, stop it, no more? We're putting an end to this. Hey, what, 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 what might at one time have been a good practice, things have become so twisted and distorted, stop it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Well, it was because of the teachers. You see, the rabbis in Jesus and James' day, they began to decipher and discern and describe which oaths were binding, which ones you had to keep, and which ones you could make an oath, but it really didn't matter whether you kept it or not. They described and they defined a system where you had an actual out in telling a lie. There's an entire section in the Mishnah, which is a Jewish commentary written by the rabbi. It's called Tractate Shavuot. Oat. That whole section is about binding and non-binding vows. It shows that taking an oath had become nothing more than a system of determining when a person could lie and when a person had to keep their vow, their oath. Kent Hughes writes this in his commentary. Listen to this. The results were disgraceful. There was an undying epidemic of frivolous swearing. Oaths were continually mingled with everyday speech. Swearing by your life, swearing by your beard, saying, may I never see the comfort of Israel if I... There was a trivialization of everyday language and a devaluation of integrity. Evasive swearing became a fine art. The height of accomplishment was, while lying, to convince another person that you were telling the truth by bringing some person or some imminent object into reference. For instance, one rabbi taught, this is actually in the Mishnah, one rabbi taught that if you swore by Jerusalem, you were not bound. But if you swore facing Jerusalem, then you had to keep that oath. How crazy is that? Evidently because that in some way implied the divine name. You see, Jesus and James lived in a time when people were using oaths, religious people were using oaths to convince others of their sincerity and commitment, and yet they were lying. Their word didn't mean a thing. A brother in Christ, a sister in Christ saying, I promise, but you know it doesn't mean a thing. It's like our modern day practice of saying, no, 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 hey, I want you to know, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I'm telling you the truth, Connie Hayes. I mean it, don't I? Cross your fingers. That same thing has been going on forever. In the beginning of our study, I shared with you some of the findings of sociologists and psychologists and authors, and I said, you know, I, I, I think we're living in a post-truth society. But after studying the Bible, after studying what's been going on, I really believe we have always lived in a post-truth world. Always. Jesus and James, Jesus says, stop it. You let your yes be yes. And when you say no, mean no. No more I promise, no more I swear. No. Be a person of your word. In Matthew 23, the religious leaders of the day had gathered around. While Jesus was speaking to the people, it's interesting how you always find that. Jesus is speaking to everyday people, and yet the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they kind of, they hang out on the fringes to see what Jesus is saying. No doubt Jesus had this oath issue in mind. Listen to this. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, see, there's that thing. He is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater? The gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on the altar, then he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, 
He who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. In a society where even the religious leaders were being deceptive and using oaths as an out, instead of a confirmation of the character of Almighty God, do you know there was still a remnant? A remnant of godly people who told the truth, even when it hurt. I got news for you. Just because somebody tells you they love Jesus doesn't mean you need to believe them. But over the course of time, if you're walking with somebody, you will learn if they are a person of truth or not. Because what's done in the darkness will come to light, Jesus said. Amen? And by their fruit, you will know them. And though all of these religious leaders in Jesus' day were doing, playing all of these games, there was a group. Josephus writes about them, the, the famous Jewish historian Josephus. They were called the Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S, -S -E -E the Essenes. They lived south of Jerusalem in a community. If you've ever heard the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were found at Qumran. If you've ever been with me to Israel, every time we've gone to Qumran. It, that's the community where the Essenes lived. And they were people of truth and character and integrity. Their yes meant yes, and their no meant no. And Josephus, who was not one of them, wrote this about them. They are eminent for fidelity, and they are the ministers of peace, writes Josephus. Whatever, listen to this, whatever they say is also more firm than an oath. But swearing is avoided by them, and they esteem it worse than perjury. For they say that he who cannot be believed without swearing by God is already condemned. I love that. Because one of the distinguishing marks of a follower of Jesus is honesty. Telling the truth. Not shading the truth, telling little white lies, using half-truths, skirting the truth, but telling the truth living truthfully and acting in a truthful, honest way in all that we do. Why is that? Why is that so central to being a follower of Jesus? Well, I'm so glad you asked. And I think we have an answer. It's in the Word of God, and it's found in Jesus Himself. Jesus said of Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, in John 14, 6. And one of the most telling scenes of Jesus' life was when he was on trial for his life. A, a trial that he lost, by the way, and paid for with his life when he was crucified on Calvary's cross, which led to his resurrection and the opportunity for you and me to be reconciled with God the Father. But while he was on trial, Pilate was having a, a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus let Pilate know, my followers are of another kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. Let's pick up in the conversation at that point. So you were a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to what? To the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. But well, doesn't Pilate sound like an American? What, what is truth after all? I mean, just because I said what I said doesn't mean that I was being dishonest. Pilate sounds like one of us. What is truth? I got news for you. There is truth, and his name is Jesus. And if you want to walk in the truth, if you want to abide in the truth, if you want to live in the truth, if you want to conduct your tr affairs in a truthful way, then you need to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. You say, oh, Mike, I can be truthful without Jesus. Oh, oh yeah, how have things gone so far? Have you ever told a lie in your life? Raise your hand. Remember, you're in the church. If you've ever told a lie in your whole life, come on, hold them up, hold them up. 
If you've told one lie, that makes you a... Ooh, man, y'all are harsh. I didn't come to church to hear that about me. If you want to know the truth, you need to know a person. And his name is Jesus. Jesus let everyone know that he is the truth. Secondly, that he came to testify to the truth. But there's a third element to this. If you go back to the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus was arrested, he prayed. And he prayed for you and me. He prayed for all of his followers. And, and in John 17, if you turn there in your Bible, we're going to read this scripture. But I want you to know before we read it, this has to be the prayer that Jesus prayed with the greatest of intensity of all of his prayers. He knew that the cross was just around the corner. We're told that as he prayed, he sweat drops of blood. And Jesus prayed this for you and me. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Sanctify them. That's, that's an interesting phrase. Set them apart. Set them apart by truth, by your truth. And then Jesus says, your word is truth. How? Here, here's a very relevant question for you and me. How, while we live in this world that is so filled with lies, so filled with lies, how, while living in this world, do we keep from getting sucked in to the world ways of living deceptively, deceitfully, and with insincerity? It's a great question. The answer is we need God's word. We need God's truth. Jesus said he is the truth. If we want to walk in truth, then we need to follow Jesus, the one who is both the truth and the one who will lead us in the path of truth and the way that we relate to one another and the way we conduct our business and the way that we, we pay our bills. Hello? I have a friend that has a business I was talking to this past week, and he has other businesses that deal with his business. And I asked him, how much of your time is devoted to people who are slow paying you or going to court for people that won't pay you? And he said, thought about it. He said, probably 70%. I said, what was that 20 years ago? Um, probably 30%. And so many of the people that deal with him, they have little fish on their business cards and on their trucks, and they come to give you an estimate and say, well, just praise the Lord. He led me to you today as they gobble you up. Folks, if we're following Jesus... We need to have integrity, honesty. We need to walk in truth. Our yes needs to be yes, and our no needs to be no. Those early followers of Jesus, they understood that, and they carried that message with them everywhere they went. Put off the old self with your deceitful ways, with your lying ways. Put it off and put on the new self. Walk in honesty. Walk in integrity. Speak truthfully to one another. If you'll turn to Ephesians 4, I'll read to you what I'm just quoting to you. Paul wrote to the brothers and sisters in Ephesus, and he says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life. That's your life before you came to know Christ. To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, to be clothed in Christ, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off what? Falsehood. And you must speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Put off falsehood, get rid of it, deception, deceit, get rid of it, crucify it, be done with it. 
and walk in integrity. Walk in honesty. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And it's only possible through an intimate, ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the truth. Because we have this propensity to bend the truth, to twist the truth, or to tell flat-out lies. And when we, go, when we resort back to our old way of life, if Christ lived within you, the Holy Spirit will convict you, what are you doing? You better go make that right. You know that wasn't the truth. Go make, no, shut up. Go make that right. That's how the Holy Spirit deals with me. Don't say what's not, don't say what you think they want. Be honest. Speak the truth. We got to get out of here. Aren't you glad we only talked about one verse today? We got to get out of here. But before we get out of here, we always end up in the same place on every Sunday, and that's in this place. It's called the place of decision. What will you do with what you've learned this morning? Will you continue to live the way you've been living? Writing your own rules for life, shading the truth when it's convenient, not living truthfully and bargaining with God whenever you need his help? Is that the way you're going to keep living? Or this morning, has the Spirit of God used the Word of God to show you that the path down you're walking, that you're walking down today, you're not walking in the steps of Jesus? And he's calling you to live a new life this morning. And yet you realize you're totally incapable of pulling it off. If that's where you're at, I want to invite you to call out to Jesus this morning. Be honest with him. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I am not worthy of your grace and mercy. I'm a sinner. Not, Lord, you know, okay, I'll admit it. I tell little white lies now and then. Okay, Lord, I'll admit it. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as them. Nah, come clean. Come clean. God, I am a sinner. And it is only your grace that can save me. It is only your grace that can turn me around and set me on the path of truth and integrity. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior, and lead me through the rest of my days as my Master and my Lord. If that's your desire, I want to invite you to come forward right now. As we stand and sing this song of invitation, just get up from your seat, excuse yourself from those around you, and come and give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart.